This enormous old tree is a magnificent American chestnut. It was one of almost four billion American chestnut trees that grew up and down the eastern seaboard roughly a century ago. Yet today, a mature living American chestnut is a sight that most Americans have never seen and chances are will never see in their lifetime. That is because the American chestnut, which ruled the hardwood forests of the eastern U.S. for longer than recorded history, is for all intents and purposes gone and has been gone for more than half a century. Of those almost four billion chestnut trees that grew in this country in 1900, only a handful are left in their natural range, and only a handful of people, mostly in their 80s and 90s, have ever seen a mature chestnut tree growing in the woods. Dean Cornett is one of those. He's in his 70s, so he caught just the end of the chestnut's reign. Chestnuts on ridges like this survive much longer than those at lower elevations. One of my first memories is walking along this path to what we called the new ground, gathering chestnuts with my father. We gathered, as I remember, about a water bucket full. We came back the next year, again looking for chestnuts, but they were gone. family land are stump rings like the one outlined with pink and an occasional remaining chestnut stump like the one shown here even those are very rare before the blight struck the chestnut made up one in four trees in its natural range that historic range extended from the Piedmont to the Ohio River Valley and from southern Maine to a little piece of northern Mississippi all told Chestnuts towered over more than 200 million acres of American forests. Most of that historic territory coincides closely with the Appalachian Mountains, and the slopes of the Appalachians were where the bulk of American chestnut trees were found. They shaded and fed Hernando de Soto and his men when they passed through the Appalachians in 1540. They were so widespread that a chronicler known only as a gentleman of Elvis when describing that journey wrote, where there be mountains, there be chestnuts. The blight that wiped out the American chestnut has been called the greatest ecological disaster to strike the world's forests in all of history. When it hit, it hit fast and hard. American chestnuts growing on the land that holds the Botanical Gardens and the Bronx Zoo were found to be dying, killed by a blight brought in on imported Asian chestnut trees. But the blight didn't stay in New York. Spread by animals, birds, and wind, it moved outward at an average of 25 miles a year, and sometimes at twice that rate, and it brought nearly total destruction with it. By 1909, the blight was established in Pennsylvania, where extreme efforts were made to stop it. There are places in Pennsylvania where they cut all the chestnut trees for miles to no avail. By 1945, the blight had moved across the entire range of the American chestnut and left ghost chestnuts in its wake, tall silver-white skeletons that towered above the living forest, like these trees on Pine Mountain in eastern Kentucky. A tree that had survived all adversaries for 40 million years had disappeared within 40. But the calamity had less to do with the speed of the disappearance than with two other factors. The first was the completeness of the destruction. Tree diseases had hit before, but never a disease that essentially left no survivors. Four billion trees just disappeared. People commonly say that more than 99.99% .99 of our American chestnuts were killed by the blight. As comprehensive as that sounds, it is a monumental understatement. If even that one ten thousandth of American chestnuts had survived, we would still have nearly 400,000 chestnuts in our woods. Yet it's estimated that only a few hundred bearing chestnuts survive today in all of that 200 million acres, perhaps one or two chestnuts in every million acres. Technically speaking, some still survive in places like Michigan, Washington, and Oregon planted there by pioneers who took chestnut seeds west with them before the blight struck. 
The fact that they are well west of the Chestnut's historic range means that they are upwind of blight spores carried by the wind and usually too distant for birds and squirrels to carry the blight from infected areas to them. But the blight can spread in other ways and some of those chestnuts are ailing. Even in the east, it's inaccurate to say that the chestnuts died. The trunks died, but something in the soil protected the roots. These roots keep trying, still today, by sending up sprouts from the old root collars. These golden leaves are growing on an American chestnut sapling, which grew from the roots of one of the original American chestnut trees. But the blight lives on in the Appalachians in oak trees. So when those chestnut saplings reach a certain size and age, perhaps five years old and 20 feet in height, which these saplings are approaching, the blight strikes them. Almost none survive long enough to bloom, much less produce nuts. The second and most important factor and the overwhelming reason that the blight was so devastating was the nature of the tree itself and what it meant to the Appalachian people. And one thing I'd like to mention here that uh, was a, quite an industry at one time, it wasn't industry either, but it was, people depend on it for a living, was chestnuts. I, I don't know how many, but I know there's a lot of them. I put that way, a lot of chestnuts around up in this mountain up here. There was a world of chestnuts up there. It's been said that chestnut was a part of the Appalachian culture from the cradle to the grave. And I can tell you, I've seen cradles that were made out of chestnut, and I've seen coffee that were made out, out of chestnut. The chestnut was so vital to the Appalachian economy because it was unlike any other tree that grew in the eastern forest. References to the spreading chestnut tree apply to chestnuts growing in the open. In the forest, a chestnut grew straight up seeking light. The chestnut in this photo rises 70 feet before it even branches. At maturity, a forest chestnut on average was 100 to 105 feet tall as tall as a 10-story building, and may at times have reached 130 feet. They ain't grow big. They was at the biggest tree, that, that the biggest tree that glowed in the woods. Have chestnut trees, Besides being taller than most trees, a chestnut was thicker. The trunk of a mature chestnut was often four to seven feet through, and sometimes its diameter was even greater, as shown in these old photographs. In 1859, an American chestnut tree somewhere on the western slopes of the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee was reported at being 33 feet in circumference, four feet off the ground, which would have made it 10 and a half feet in diameter at nearly breast height. Another tree in the Great Smokies was reported by a forester to have measured out at almost five feet in diameter, 65 feet up the trunk. This old, nearly rotted away stump ring on the Cornette land is wider than an outstretched person. More impressive still is the report that in 1934, a large chestnut stump was found at Greenbrier, North Carolina, that measured 13 feet the long way. While the past 60 years have reduced the dead chestnut trees to remnants, one huge old chestnut stood until about 10 years ago on the land of John and Gary Back in Letcher County, Kentucky. It has fallen now, but the stump is still partially intact and the fallen trunk still stretches well down the hillside. When it was still standing, John Back and two of his friends tried to reach around it. The trunk was so large that the three of them together, although they could span about 18 feet, could not touch fingers around the tree. Besides their enormous size, Chestnut trees grew faster than their neighbors, maybe half again as fast as oaks, and usually 20% faster than even quick-growing poplars. It was said that in the time a seedling of another tree made a baseball bat, a chestnut made a railroad tie. Chestnuts also sprouted prolifically. If you cut a chestnut, the roots would immediately send up sprouts, and more than one of those would grow to a good size in a very short time. In this photo, you can see not only the parent stump, but under Scott Friedhoff's hands, a foot-wide sprout remnant. In this photo, taken before the blight hit, chestnut sprouts form an almost perfect circle around the cut stump. In the early 1900s, before the blight, the newly formed U.S. Forest Service recommended deliberately cutting large chestnuts to encourage multiple trees. It was called coppicing, and the chestnut was one of the best coppicing trees in the forest. 
Besides that, a chestnut could live 400 to 600 years. All in all, it was nearly a perfect tree. Almost every part of the chestnut yielded something, and the most valuable product was probably the wood, but the most widely known product was the nuts. One chestnut tree would produce as much as three bushels of chestnuts, sometimes much more. So four billion trees could annually yield as much as 12 billion bushels of mast, which is the usual Appalachian term for chestnut, oak, beech, and other nuts found in the woods. Chestnuts were also one of the most reliable nut crops in the woods. The blooms were cream colored and six to eight inches long, and the tree would often be almost covered. Donald Peaty described a forest of blooming chestnuts stirred by the wind as looking like a sea of white combers plowing across its surface. Where there were whole hillsides of chestnuts, it was an unforgettable display. The blooms opened in late June and lasted some while, and you'd often hear it said that the mountains looked like they were white with snow on the 4th of July. Noel Moore could remember the honey from chestnut blossoms. The blossoms gave up one of the best honey crop we ever had. Whenever the chestnut bloomed in the morning, early, the trees looked like just the whole tops were alive with honeybees working on getting the nectar. 30 or 40 years ago, Jake Waldrup of North Carolina described what the chestnuts were like. The nuts grow inside a bird, and it's a big thing, as big as your fist. And along about the fall of the year, when it starts frosting, they'll open. Then the chestnut falls out, and later the burr itself will drop off. I've seen them a time or two in the fall. It'd come a dry spell of weather, and the burrs would open, but there wouldn't be enough moisture, and the nut wouldn't get loose of the burr. I've seen hundreds of bushels hanging up. Then it'd start to cloud up, rain some, and it was a sight on earth. Just in an hour or two, the whole earth would be covered with chestnuts. Noel Moore remembered the same bounty. You could go into the woods in the fall and where a log falling across the side of the hill and the chestnuts would roll down again. You could reach down and pick them up by a double handful. Richard C. Davis quotes one Appalachian woman as saying, a grove of chestnuts is a better provider than a man. Easier to have around, too. American chestnuts were smaller than Chinese or European chestnuts, only about the size of a nickel, but they were prized much more than their larger cousins. People who have tasted the American chestnut say neither European chestnuts nor Chinese chestnuts can compare to it and to its close relative, the Allegheny chinkapin. I've gathered a many one of them. It had a sticky burr, and then you had to crack, get that burr off of them. You boiled them and boiled them and boiled them and then you crack them and you eat them, they're soft. In the Appalachians, people gathered chestnuts not only to eat, but to sell. They often had to compete with their own livestock to do that. One Blue Ridge resident remembered going out by lantern light to gather chestnuts to beat the hogs to them. Others remembered competing with turkeys to get to the chestnuts first. Once they were gathered, people put them in sacks and took them on horseback or by wagon to a buyer. Sometimes the buyer would be a local store owner. At one time they'd haul those things with a wagon load, you know, just to have a lot of chestnuts. I seem to remember from somewhere that Cecil told somebody that his father one year shipped, I think it was 17 or 18 wagon loads of chestnuts out of, out of his store. Now, that's, that's just memory, but uh, I think he had his wagons all lined up and shipped them all at one time and took them over to Stuart and shipped them all on Enterprising local people would sometimes take them to a distant market themselves. I grew up listening to Chestnut's stories from my dad. During the Depression, he and a first cousin would load an old uh, eight-model Ford full of chestnuts and moonshine whiskey, I have to tell you that, and <laughs> haul it to Washington, D.C., <clears throat> and pedal the chestnuts on the street and sell a little moonshine whiskey to wash it down with. <laughs> Once a wholesaler had bought the chestnuts, they were shipped out of the Appalachians multiple ways. In Kentucky, they were often put on steamboats plying the Big Sandy and taken down river to the Ohio and sometimes the Mississippi, where they supplied the big river cities along the way. 
The most common transportation out of the region was probably railroad, and huge quantities of chestnuts left the mountains that way. One railroad station in West Virginia shipped 155,000 pounds of chestnuts in the autumn of 1911. In October 1915, the Patrick County, Virginia newspaper reported that the D&W Railway has been taking away a car of chestnuts every day for some time. About 30 wagon loads of that, roughly 60,000 pounds across a single weekend, came from a single Virginia hamlet called Meadows of Dan. People with no other cash income could depend on selling chestnuts year after year to get their essentials. One woman is quoted in the Foxfire books as saying, I was as stingy with them as I could be. I'll just tell you the truth. When I was little, I thought every chestnut I picked up had to be sold. Oftentimes, no cash actually changed hands. Part of the chestnuts would be turned over to a storekeeper to pay off bills at the store, and the rest of them traded for shoes or sugar or salt, or some other item people could not easily produce for themselves. Whole families would make expeditions to the woods in the fall to collect chestnuts to use or sell. Years ago, Woodrow Whitaker tells me that it was considered by him a right of passage into young adulthood to be allowed to go with his older brothers and his dad to the Black Mountain in the fall of the year to gather chestnuts. And they'd leave home early one morning and they'd go up town and through the Scuttle Hole Gap and down the Pine Mountain on the other side. And when they'd hit the Cumberland River bottoms, they'd turn left upstream, take them up to the mouth of Franks Creek where they had to turn right toward the Virginia line. And somewhere in those bottoms right there, they made camp. And early the next morning, they'd get up, continue on their way up to the great chestnut forest on the Black Mountain, fill their wagon and load their horses with chestnuts and make their way back down the mountain and down Franks Creek to their campground. And they'd stay there that night. And the next morning, they'd get up early again and make their way back down the Cumberland, up Pine Mountain, through the Scuttle Hole, back down this side to town and eventually back to Rock House here with a winter supply of chestnuts. We knew when this radio rock because the birds would be getting to open up and uh, and the chestnuts fall out, you know, and we knew they was ready. Sometimes the whole thing fell off. The schools all turn out and let the children go to the woods. Chestnut mass supported all kinds of life. The millions of passenger pigeons that flew the skies of the eastern U.S. in the 1800s were sustained by chestnut mast. Wild turkeys were, bears were, so were other birds and smaller animals. Chestnut mast also fed livestock. People in the 1800s and early 1900s would turn their hogs loose in the woods, and they would forage freely across property lines. An elderly Appalachian named Man Norton said his father almost always had 150 or 200 hogs running loose in the woods, as did most families. There was no concern about observing property boundaries because there were so many chestnuts, but it was the practice in most places to identify the hogs to owners by unique notch patterns in their ears, in the same way that brands identified cattle in the open ranges of the Old West. In the fall, the hogs would grow fat on chestnuts. In fact, hog meat was one of the best cash crops for mountaineers. Up in the mountains, when you're in Floyd, just up the road, just about two or three miles, the people used to grow a lot of hogs, turn them loose in the mountain, and they, my father said never used a boy, they didn't even know how, exactly how many hogs they had. Turn them wild up there, you know, from all over the mountain. But they were all the mountain, and they just lived in there. They lived on the chestnuts and acorns. They just lived on them. They didn't have to fatten them at all. Didn't have any corn, have food for the corn. He was a boy, so they decided to get some, go to Roanoke, had to have some money, you know. He said, my father was a boy now. But I know my father said he'd go up in the mountain and he had an old mountain rifle and his uncle. My father's uncle, he'd go up and he'd kill so many hogs, go and dress them, pack them on a wagon, go to Roanoke, be gone a week. In addition to the annual bonanza of nuts, there was the value of the wood. Chestnut trees were huge so one tree yielded a lot of timber. The wood was strong, light, very straight grain for most of its length, and split easily. So it was ideal for shingles and shakes, and also for fence rails. When Abraham Lincoln was earning his nickname as the rail splitter, it's likely that some of the wood he was splitting was American chestnut. 
Chestnut was prized for furniture and musical instruments because of its straight grain and the way it took a finish. So the wood from chestnuts makes the prettiest furniture. I've got a frame right there now as a chestnut frame. And that was from old tree on Lone Park. Chestnut was also used for houses, for barns, and for many other needs of everyday life. By looking at the grain of this wood, you can see why so many people used it for different things, like splitting rail by the grain. You can tell how, that it would split easy by the way it looked at the grain of the wood. It was also a favorite for kindling because it was so easily split into the small pieces needed to start a fire. Long after the blight had brought the chestnuts down, people still sought them for kindling. I remember me and my dad, we'd get kindling wood up there. We'd take cross-cut saw, and we would saw the chestnut logs up into blocks that we could handle manually. Uh, everybody would just gather around and uh, kind of bring their own hatchets and sit around and tell old tales. 12 noon till, say, late in the evening, around 4 or 5 o'clock, uh, that pile of kindling would get pretty high. We always, in the fall, we'd go and pull us out two or three and and saw them up in, with a, in the about 18 inch blocks and then we uh, would split them up for the winter and we'd fill our wood house full of wood because we had a wood coal, uh, cook stove and two fireplaces. It took a lot of wood. But while chestnut was great for kindling, it wasn't used much once the fire was going because it popped and cracked so much that embers would escape the fireplace and threaten to set the house on fire. There used to be an old man, Johnny Fields, lived between the twin bridges. He uh, always told that his mother wanted to be buried in the chest of casket so that uh, when she went through hell, she could go popping and cracking. <laughs> As said, chestnut wood was very rot resistant. Contact with the ground didn't break it down the way it did other wood. The fact of the business is, if it gets down in there where no air gets to it, I don't know whether it ever rot or not. There's old sogs. That's an old tree that's fell and gotten buried up in the dirt. You can dig out and they'll be sound as can be. Logs that have been laying there for hundreds of years. The tree was so rot resistant because it was high in tannic acid, so much tannic acid that the trees were sometimes called tan bark chestnuts. The tannic acid that made it rot resistant and therefore good for telephone poles and similar applications also made it invaluable for tanning animal hides. It became common when chestnuts were cut to strip the bark from the log and ship it to a tannery. Once the tree was down, the bark would be cut into four foot lengths and then peeled off the log with a spud like the one shown in the girl's hand. Then it would be piled against the log sap side down to dry. Once it was dry, the tan bark would be hauled out of the woods on a sled like the one shown here and loaded into wagons to go to market. Sometimes the tree was cut only for the bark and the log was left lying, but other times the tannin was extracted from the log as well, and then the chips used to make paper. Some of the strong opposition to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park came from paper manufacturers who fought against losing the great number of trees, including and perhaps especially chestnuts, that grew on lands being condemned to create the park. While industry suffered a blow when the chestnuts disappeared, they were able to switch to alternative wood for telephone poles, tannin, and paper. The impact was otherwise for the Southern Appalachian people. It would not be overstating the case to describe the impact to some of the population as devastating. The four best cash crops in many Southern Appalachian counties were said to be chestnuts, hogs, apples, and moonshine. When the blight killed the chestnuts, it also killed the trade in hogs because most people couldn't afford hog feed to replace chestnut mast. Southern Appalachians lost two of their four best sources of cash in a single blow. The economic blow was compounded in Southern Appalachia by the timing of the devastation. The blight struck many areas at roughly the same time the Great Depression struck. The economic blow to the Southern Appalachians was irrecoverable. Some old timers say the chestnut blight ushered in the end of subsistence farming in the Appalachians. They link the destruction wrought by the chestnut blight to the beginning of the great Appalachian outmigration toward wage jobs. That economic blow may be partly why people with memories of that time still mourn the chestnut. I don't remember 
exactly when the blight came. But it was devastating. We all regretted it so bad because we all loved the chestnuts. People who were too young to experience the loss personally understood it through the reactions of older people. The only time I ever saw tears in my dad's eyes was when he would talk about the chestnut, the loss of the chestnut, what that meant to the mountain people. Some of them, like Rex Mann, have committed themselves to doing something about the loss of the chestnut. All of their options depend on the availability of living trees. For that reason, it is a cause for celebration when a chestnut old enough to bloom is found. Besides finding these large living trees, individual landowners have made efforts to nurse along the saplings that grow from the old roots until they are old enough to bloom. To do that, you need to catch the cankers that infect the tree before they have girdled it. This American chestnut tree growing here on a ridgetop in Letcher County does have chestnut blight growing on it here at the base of the tree, and that's really typical because that's where the bark will split first. And so the, you typically see the, the fungus attack the tree uh, at the base like that. One remedy for this, this canker on, on this tree would be to dig up just a little soil from around the tree here, mix it with water in a bucket, pack it on there. It's called mud packing. There's a fungus in the soil that will then kill the fungus on the tree and you're supposed to leave the mud pack on for, for one year. So if we, if we mud pack it now, we come back for next year and, and take the plastic and the duct tape off and that canker should be healed up. Preserving chestnut sprouts until they bloom, along with finding new mature chestnuts in bloom, are both important for biodiversity if the chestnut is ever to be successfully restored. Over the years, there have been a number of such restoration efforts. If these efforts prosper, there is hope that the American chestnut will once again grace the eastern U.S. and chestnut snow will once again whiten the mountains on the 4th of July.